Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Know the Rules of the Game podcast for Captivating Graphics. I'm your host, Desiree Patno. I'm the CEO and President of Women in the Housing Real Estate Ecosystem and AWRB and Desiree Patno Enterprises, Inc., DPE, the real estate brokerage and advisor and investor for Amicus Brain, AI for Aging Population, also the Chief Strategic Officer for Zulu Time and the publisher of NAWRB Magazine and the Weary Report. Today, we are very honored to have as our guest, Kendall Roderick. Hey, NRB Senior Graphic Designer. She graduated with a Bachelor of Art in Graphic Design and has been designing for over 10 years, of which seven years have been with NRB. Welcome, um, Kendall. Thank you for being on with us today. Thank you. I'm super excited. Yeah, yeah. I'm so excited too. And also, we have your fabulous husband. Um, as a bonus, we have Ronnie Roderick, he's a freelance industrial designer. He graduated with a Bachelor's of Science in Transportation Design at the Art Center Des College of Design in Pasadena, which I was president at, very cool, and has worked with cars for over the past 20 years. So thank you, Ronnie, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah, I'm so excited. It was really cool to be there for the whole day at your design stuff. It's just so exciting. Um, so one of the fun things about, you might not know about Kendall, is, is that the two of them have been swing dancing for several years and they teach all over the world. They love to read and go on adventures in their 1950s trailer that they recently fixed up. Tell me a little about that. What, what got you motivated you two to go buy this really cool trailer and fix it all up? Uh, I think kind of the idea of being able to travel and explore and I guess live a little bit more freely when we want to. We wanted to start with something pretty tiny because we weren't sure if we would like it. And you never really know what something's like until you try it. Um, we definitely learned a lot taking that little trailer out and all the rules, um, depending on which state you are in for uh, parking it. But it's been an adventure and it's uh, definitely been, uh, well, it's been fun. It's been a big learning experience, I think, um, learning how to live in a a space that's you know 60 square feet that's not what most people are <laughs> it's like using. a new york apartment <laughs> well, <that's very> true. <laughs> well think about it how perfect is that if you think about the pandemic that we're going on right now um those people who are living in new york in the flats the epic center of the pandemic and so here you are you actually bought something to travel in it to test it out so i mean you were and I remember you buying it and painting it and, and fixing it up with putting the, the drawers and the cabinets and, and having it to where you can have your animals into it and take it camping and all that kind of good stuff. So when you say a learning experience, other than the axles and all the framework, how, how was it camping and all that kind of good stuff? I mean, what were the trade-offs of being in that small versus in living in a home? I think the, the main problem was just um, when you're trying to camp in California, all of the campgrounds get reserved immediately. So they're released six months ahead of time and Californians are on top of it. So like there's not <laughs> the spontaneity that we thought there would be, but right. as we've gone away from California, there's a lot more opportunity to do, what is it, the dunking? What is boondocking. It? Boondocking, boondocking, which is pretty much where you park on government land and it's free. So we've done that a couple of times and that's been fun. Yeah, and I think the goal with our trailer too, a lot of people have trailers that you have to hook up to electricity oh, yes. and uh, sewer and stuff like that. But we wanted to have something that was totally off grid. Um, we could really park it anywhere and be able to use it. And I think that's- That's been nice. been really cool, yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Well, so with that creativity it goes into our whole focus today is gonna be about the you know, the design and the cap, how do, how do you captivate an audience? Because if you think about it, we have 99% of, or close to 99% of the entire United States shelter in place. And how do you, you know, the average right now is everyone's looking at media and how to, you know, stream data, whether it's, um, you know, streaming information and looking at YouTube or, you know, looking at, they're looking at information, but it's the lowest amount of ads that we've had out there right now. So if you're in the business, you know, dealing with, we had the big thing about the SBA and the, and the PPP and the idle loan that just happened last podcast, what are we looking at today as far as how do we captivate um, the design? You know, you've been with me for seven years and you've taught me so much, Kendall, 
And I've been so honored to, I have a, a vision and you just take and go with it. And you have all these great visions and I go, oh my gosh, this is fantastic. So what is it really, we want to break it down today for the three rules that are so important. You've always talked to me about Desiree, what is your, I go to the very thing, first thing we look at. So the first rule you have is balance. Describe to me what that means and how that relates to both of you and what that could do to help our, our listeners today. Sure thing. Thanks, Desiree. Um, I think right now during the pandemic, a lot of people are experimenting with design. They're pulling out those iPads. They're using their Apple pens. They're really playing with what they can do on their own because they have a lot more time on their hands. And our first rule is balance. And balance has to do with a few different elements of design. It has to do with the actual designing. And then it can also have to do with working with a client. So if you're working with a graphic designer or I'm working with a client, the balance you have between their ideas and what you can kind of give them to finish that idea. But we're mostly going to dive into the balance of an actual design. Right, visual balance. So I mean, with any design, you have, you know, multiple elements to it. And it's really important that you balance those in a way that's cohesive and they work together um, to create something that's visually appealing and so you can get your point across because I think a lot of visual design is, you know, you're trying to make a point, you're trying to share a message and you want to do that in the most effective way possible. You'll see a lot of times with clients, they want what they see in their head. They want all of it. And unfortunately having all of it, having that chaos of everything you want to push in there doesn't necessarily, um, let the viewer interpret interpret your vision properly. So it's also taking a step back and balancing your own thoughts and your own mind of what you actually want to pull forward into your design. Because it can get very overwhelming, especially all of you people out there who are trying to start design for the first time, like create a list. What is your objective for this design? And figure out how you can actually present it without overwhelming your viewer. So thank you for that, both of you. So if you if I were to look at this as a balance, so you're actually talking like a chef has to sit there and have the different textures of the food and the different balance of, of um, not overpowering flavor. So you're talking about the balance of who you're talking to, what that looks like, and so you're not oversaturating because there's too much because too much of a good thing can can really over uh, you know it becomes too much and you just look away from the design, right? Well, it's so interesting you mentioned that too, because if I was thinking about food in design sense, I would think about the plate and the presentation of the plate and how you have kind of like the meat and the potatoes and the vegetables and how those things balance each other, but also kind of, they're very different from one another. So they take different elements and visually you can see it on like a really well pre presented chef's plate. That's another type of design. Like they're designing the way they're putting that food on your in order to have the most appealing and wonderful experience. So, excellent. So if you were to look at that for one of the things that I absolutely loved, um, uh, Ronnie, is that when I went and saw your three models that you made when you graduated from the um, design school, um, you had a van that was self-contained and it was really about, you were thinking about the future. Um, and the balance on how you would have, you know, make sure there's enough room for this, enough room for that. That same design balance also comes in the functionality, right? Of the um, balance of not only what you're trying to interpret of, of looking at a, you know, a, a flat two-dimensional versus three-dimensional object. So define how that balance works in that capacity. Um, I think for that, Specifically, um, you know, you're creating a living space, but you also have a vehicle. So you have to balance those two functions and you mm -hmm. have to design it in a way where one doesn't hinder the other. They actually complement each other. It's like, how can you use those two totally different things um, to make a cohesive, balanced um, space? And I think that, you know, that that is definitely true in a lot of design. There's multiple elements that you're trying to balance. and um, you know, I think that's a super important element to think about. Thank you. Cause, cause one of the things, the reason I brought it up and is, is that if you think about you getting a car now, okay. So do you have all your cleansing, you know, and cleaning supplies and, 
And when you go out now, it's it's an it's an honor to go out to the store or the or the pharmacy or something to you know get what you need, and you got to make sure you have all that stuff. So you have to have it all arranged, right? And so for Kendall, when you're going out to present an ad or you're creating an art piece to present, what's that image? You know, right now we've got to create a, a an image for our special um, edition of the magazine that's coming out for. Um, you know, essential women preserving the quality of life, you know, what it's going to be on that cover. And so we've got to balance the, the um, idea of not being overwhelming. And so we've had to go back and forth and we've had several issues in the back of how that balance work. So define a little bit more on how you look at the, the too much of, you know, like we're trying to present the whole world of what's in the magazine versus then just on the cover. How, how does that break down in the balance of that too? Just as like what Ronnie talked about the over usage of you know, space versus a vehicle combination. So I would say that the balance in that scenario comes from how much we give our viewer and how much they can interpret in a certain amount of time. They say on average that within a glance, we should be able to interpret the design. And if we don't, then it's kind of like we've missed our shot. There are some people who, of course, will take longer. They will spend more time looking. But on average, if you don't catch them in that glance, uh, three seconds, we'll say, is your top amount, then you've kind of lost your viewer. So when you balance an image, you want to make sure that you're not insulting your viewer. You're not overdoing it so that they feel like, oh my gosh, she really had to try hard for me to get this. But you want to make sure that it's so fluid that it comes into their mind and it feels just natural. It feels effortless, which is going into the good design should always be effortless. If you're thinking about it, then it's bad design because it should just flow and you should just understand that concept. So what we're trying to do with our current magazine is we're creating a um, a contrast between New York current or currently <laughs> and New York from before the pandemic and how the streets have changed, how those floods of people enjoying the city that they've never been to or that they're working in and they're trying to get to Broadway. It's like that versus now where nothing is happening. We're living in a complete like apocalyptic book right now where the streets are empty and the vines are starting to grow over. So we want to be able to show that without distracting the viewer, but also getting our message across as clearly and as efficiently as possible. Very cool. So you brought up a couple things. So first rule was balance. And we now got into our second rule, which is contrast. And so we've done this before um, where we've taken the, like we talked about here in New York that, you know, showing how we went to sleep on March 12th, we woke up on March 13th and we had a ton of, um, you know, people sitting on a bustling, hustling, you know, a shoulder to shoulder kind of impact. And then the next moment, you know, no one's allowed to go and we're shut down and, and you have to be um, shelter in place. So how do you, mm -hmm. how do you cut that in half? And, and one of the things that, you know, mentally, if you've never been to New York, you know, are the two streets identical, the sides identical? No, you're supposed to have it split. How does it I mean very different, you know, to mentally put that in place, but we've done this before. We did it back in, I'm gonna say what, four or five years ago where we had a woman, here we are in New York again. If you think about it, we had a woman that you, uh, that you created with a hat that she was working in the um, fields, you know, um, and she was, you know, hat was completely covered, hat, cloaked and everything. And she was a cotton picker and or work in the wheat farm. And then as she crossed over from a very dark and dreary um, environment, she turns into this beautiful model as she's entering into the city as a very um, poised woman going in for a business into downtown New York. <laughs> yes, thank you for, for mentioning that. That is definitely good use of contrast. So um, what she's referring to is a piece that we created about five years ago, and it was a woman, and the contrast was two things. It was the farm life versus the city life, and it was the day versus the night. And so the contrast was very strong in that piece, very visually, because you literally had night and day 
for the job occupation and we had night and day literally so that's like a great use of contrast contrast is um, a great design element because it's very eye-catching it's very usually immediate and it normally stops your viewer and makes them do a second uh, take yeah and I would say um, <clears throat> you know contrast even goes beyond kind of the more obvious idea that you guys are talking about um, if you think about kind of the contrast of you know uh, font on paper that we're reading it's black and white Very true. and you know that's that's about as much contrast as you can get um, but it makes it readable it makes it something that we can visually take in and immediately understand and I think for design that's something that's very important it's like the viewer has to be able to immediately look at something and get the idea and I think contrast is a big element in that and contrast can also be um like you see a lot of ads where there's like a donut, for instance, on a very plain background. That contrast is from like the texture and the color of an object versus something very plain on the background. It's popping. There's there's this very strong element of visualing, visualization. Um, it's kind of like when someone is like hunting and they're in camouflage. You do not want that with design. You do not want things to all be the same value. You do not want things to blend in with one another. You want things to pop and you want that visualization to happen as fast as possible and for recognition to happen very quickly. Excellent. So the other thing for contrast I'd like to add for all our <clears throat> older um, aging population that contrast is very <laughs> important so we can read uh, with the True. contrast, you can have light and dark. It gives you the objective readability of being able to see the object a little bit better and read. Um, so just as a different a light of contrast, right? So I'd like to take a, a second to step back to rule number one. And I'd like to go back to balance because I would like to really define the rules of balance. So if you were to give me three rules of balance versus three rules that we don't do for balance, what would those be if we were to very, very um, point on that, on the rule number one? Sure. Um, so for an example of balance for number one, if I can put it in this way, um, visually, I want you to picture equal sizes. So you have squares all on a page and all of them are the exact same size and they fill the entire page versus having like one square on one side that's a certain size and multiple squares on the other that balance that bigger square but are not the same. So those are two different types of balance that you can have, but I would argue that good design would normally go towards the bigger square with the smaller squares balancing it out. And then I would say even with that, you could have, you can use your background or your white space as a way to balance. You can have a large object on one side and a smaller object on the other. And, you know, immediately look at that and you think, oh, that's not balanced. But then you look at the white space behind it and that has its own visual mass as well that's balancing out the image. A good designer is going to have a more complex um, way of understanding balance than someone just starting off. So it's actually very difficult because every single piece, every single type of design, whether we're working with a visual design on paper or an actual um, object, mm -hmm. they're all gonna have different rules of balance. So it's a quite complex, but it is very learnable and um, also very dependent on opinions. Like one thing we haven't talked about yet is just <laughs> graphic design and opinions. It's going to change things for everybody. <laughs> yeah, we know. <laughs> no, it is. It, and interpretation. I mean, it's so important. Mm, uh, yep. uh, what I vision, or you vision, or anyone envisioned, because what you have, and that's why I believe the true artist will go into an art gallery, right, or a museum, and you'll see someone walk by a picture and they'll get it. Yeah, okay, that's beautiful and keep on going. And then someone will stop and they'll stare at this painting for hours because they're so intrigued and trying to get in the mind of the artists of what they were thinking, where they were going and how they evolved, right? And where this picture took them. Um, 
And that's where it's a whole different uh, venue for, you know, captivating the art because the fact is, is or the design, because the, the medium is, is a long term of an artist who appreciates it. Hence, they spend, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars for a piece of, you know, um, uh, canvas or, or three dimensional art um, and go with it. So if we go back to balance um, on, you know, a cover or something we talked about, it was very interesting how you talked. Um, I remember when you told me a couple years ago to where some of the art pieces that you create have, have, you know, 125 pieces of layered art. How do you keep the balance of so much art and so many layers um, on a piece without making it so overwhelming like that? Oh, you mean, you mean keeping my sanity is what you mean. <laughs> That too. There are um, moments. <laughs> so I will say that I know it seems like a lot of layers and I have worked. Um, one of my specialties before I came into NARAB um, was photo manipulation. And photo manipulation is a very fun way of taking multiple pieces of art or photos, I guess, and creating one art piece. So like Desiree, I could, I could make you into a fairy flying over New York City. And like I would spend a, like 10 hours creating this one image. And I would probably put like 300 layers in because I would be, the thing is, is like there'd be 50 layers in your wings and there would be um, like multiple layers in the city because I'd be changing elements of the city to make it cleaner and more capable of kind of having you in it. And so even though it seems like it would be overwhelming have that having that many layers, it really comes down to groups. You group these layers and you, you label them, so uh -huh. Desiree the fairy, and then <laughs> you, uh, you're able to kind of put them into a package that's a lot more digestible and you can work on them in sections. So it's not that there's like 300 images on top of each other. It's like little tiny things that are all separate. And some designers work differently. Sometimes they draw over everything. So they just do one canvas and they draw on top of everything and they paste on top of everything and they flatten on top of everything which is something Ronnie does that yeah. drives me absolutely I, nuts. I would say that I, I do design more like that work. But I mean, I think back to the original question, to keep the balance from the start, you really have to have an idea, kind of a concept of what you're trying to achieve. If you just try to throw 300 different images into one canvas and piece them all together, it's going to be, you know, more of a collage than the, a composition that has a focal point and an objective. So as a designer, you really have to think about that from the very beginning, whether that's with a sketch or just an idea that's in your head and you kind of already have a vision for where you're going with that. Very cool. Well, I know that that's what the whole idea is, Kendall, when you made the woman walking up the side of the building and you had it had her break in the glass ceiling. You literally had shards of glass falling out of the sky as she's, bust, as she's running um, up with her briefcase up the side of the glass building. And so that had tremendous amount of layers of art. I remember that. And so mm -hmm. it turned out absolutely beautiful um, as another color. So that's a great aspect. And, and I agree. So if we move back now to, so thank you for that, Ronnie, too. I, I think the fact that you have different techniques and you both are exceptional at what you do, um, it just shows that whatever you're comfortable with and whatever works at the end game has to be that you look at it and it just captivates you, right? Um, and that captivation could be interpreted different ways um, and that's what is so different and what's so intriguing um, about this so we're trying to give you everyone our, our podcast listeners the the value add of, of some rules that you don't really get to see that are applicable to what's going on especially when you're doing design as simple as creating a food dish as simple as creating something arts and crafts for the children giving them some techniques as they're young so if we go back to contrast in you know, we can have contrast of texture, we can have contrast of color, we can have contrast of, of size. How do you keep it from becoming too obnoxious? And I hate to use that word, but I'm going to in the sense that it becomes too overpowering um, because <clears throat> some of us can, like myself can be a little bit overpowering. Um, how do you keep that balance and contrast to be, you know, contained? Um, I would say that um, as a graphic designer, if you are a graphic designer and you aren't trying to do this on your own, I mean, either way, um, that all depends on your client. So a graphic designer has the ability to point a client in the right direction, but at the end of the day, the client is always right. 
And um, one thing that they always suggested in school, or one thing they told you not to do, was never give your client your idea and say it's better. Um, they always say that you do exactly what the client wants, and then you take your own time and you create what you think they might like instead, and you try to ease them into something that has the right balance, the right contrast, the right hierarchy, and you just try your best to direct them towards that. Like, it's, it's a tough because it's a relationship with your client. It's very rare that a graphic designer has the ability to do whatever they want unless they're doing it for them and can follow the rules the way they want to. Mm, got and it. I, so, I, think, but... I was going to say, I think, uh, you know, with anything, you know, too much of something can often be overwhelming. So I think as a designer, you just really have to know, you know, how to use contrast, when and where to use contrast. Uh, to make it effective and not overwhelming because you, with anything you can you can make something confusing and overwhelming by just doing too much which i think leads us into our next um our next uh rule well, that's true yes want to go into that ronnie sure the next rule is hierarchy um and i think from the beginning of a part project you have to really decide you know what is the most important thing you're trying to convey and then from there you know what level of importance does everything else carry um, because when you're trying to convey an idea or a message you really need to con convey that in the most effective way possible and what he had just mentioned before with um, why i thought it kind of ventured into this next role is you can take all the different elements that your client wants on a piece of paper and they all are sitting there and they're just kind of in your face and you can what you can do to lessen that and create hierarchy is you can lower the opacity you can change the color you can desaturate it you can make it smaller so ideally what you want to do with visual design is you want to know where the viewer's eye should go first so if i was creating an ad and i was really trying to hit home on women in poverty i would probably want their eyes to go to the crying woman first i'd want them to actually feel her tears before i wanted them to see her scenario so it's about visually making her stand out more than anything else on that page so that their eyes go there first your job as a designer is to kind of be like a puppeteer or someone who's going to direct you to exactly what you want them to see and then the next thing and then the next thing and so one of the things i always want to play with is a lot of opacities and light and dark because your eyes usually go to the most contrast on the page um mm -hmm. your eyes also usually go to the largest thing on the page right. and that's another reason why balance you want to maybe have something big with a lot of little things that balance it out and also with the contrast why you want to have something like darker with a lighter background so that your eye has that ability to go to that first place first and those all kind of lead into creating hierarchy and creating a visual kind of story on a page so i love it this is the meat guys this is the real meat of how do we it's it, you know here we are at the pandemic here we are at such an incredible time of of relationships and it's not what you say, it's not what you do, it's how you make someone feel. You're gonna remember that feeling for the rest of your life. It's like that old adage in high school, you know, what happened in high school, you never forget that feeling. Or when you hear a song, you never forget that feeling where you were in the moment of hearing that beat to go with the song, right? Um, and I believe like you just said, you know, you, you said, you know, when you're creating that woman in, in poverty, that you're the crying woman, you know, that amplification of making how you feel and then you're going to look at the rest of the ad. Well, now that you're, you're, you're like, you know, broken up and saying, okay, how can I fix this problem? How can I help, you know, to where stop her from crying, give her a hug. And what, what does that mean to do that? So one of the things that I find in, in, in real estate or dealing any kind of ad, you know, we're dealing with now, you know, millions and millions of people losing their job. You're dealing with the housing market. You're dealing with, you know, the capacity of everything that's being done and, and uh, how you live, where you work, and it all has to deal with the, the entire ecosystem. So how do, you, how do you tell 
our listeners that how do they stand out um, to to make someone or get them to feel uh, uh, something in the ad they're creating? Because a lot of them are going to be their own client. That's not going to be that they're designing for someone else. They're going to be designing for themselves to amplify, to get someone else to see it, to, to try to get their message. So what would be the best advice that you think you could give to you if we're dealing with you know the the work environment the the housing environment do you feel comfortable that you know to go out there and, and in that 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 how are you going to make someone feel better um in in the capacity of creating that that captivating uh, design what do you think would be some good pointers on that i think back to the hierarchy i think you know if you're designing for yourself you kind of have to put down a list of you know what you're trying to convey and decide what the most important thing is and make sure that's the emphasis, make sure that's the first thing that people read. And, you know, I think right now, um, for a lot of people, it's, you know, connecting with people on a personal level. I mean, I think that's kind of the way to open the door and get somebody's attention. Um, if you can connect with them, they're going to take the time to actually look at the rest of what you have to say. So, um, you know, I think in a lot of ways, that's maybe the most important thing to focus on right now. I'd also say if you're new to design and you're trying to do this on your own, I'd say less is more. If you're trying to convey a particular thing, maybe you should only have that thing on the page. Because, <clears throat> go ahead. Um, well, I was going to say too, um, a little bit off topic, but you know, if you if you are new to design, if you're trying to design stuff for yourself, um, you know, I would find somebody that you trust and have them look at it, and don't you know, don't give them any leading you know, information going into it, just kind of show them. Commentary. <laughs> right. You want, you want them to look at it and kind of come to their own conclusion. And if it's not what you're trying to get across, maybe you need to kind of revisit, you know, the hierarchy of what you're presenting or the contrast or the balance or any of those elements. I would say even farther of that, have you ever brought anything to your mom? And she's like, yeah, it's great. But if you bring something to your mom and you're like, oh, so-and-so created this, and she's like, mm, I don't know if I really like it. I would say that you can't necessarily get anyone's true opinion on anything. And if you really want someone's opinion, don't tell them it's yours. Show it to them and see what they say. And most of the time, if they're going to say something bad, they're probably going to be like, well, did you create this? And you'd be like, no. And then they'll be like, okay, I don't like it. I mean, honestly, Spend a little time to get true feelings because you're going to put this out in the world and it's going to probably affect whether or not you make money or not. So why not actually get a real opinion? It might hurt. I will say that to get a tough skin for any creative field, writing or designing, modeling, <laughs> modeling, like you have to learn to handle rejection and it is hard and you're going to get angry. And eventually, after like a thousand of them, which does happen eventually, you stop putting your heart on that page when you hand it over. Like you can put your heart into the design when you're creating it, but then you take that away and you see it as just something that was created and you can create more and you just let it be. Like you cannot hold on to those things. Yeah, I think that's a super good point because, uh, you know, as, a, as somebody who hasn't designed a lot before, you're going to get attached to that design oh, putting all your passion. effort and passion into it and you're gonna think it's the best thing in the world and i think you know that's one of those things you really have to step back and try to be super objective about it and not only that but as a new designer you're gonna take a long time to make something something that is going to take me 15 minutes is probably going to take you two hours because i've been working on these <laughs> programs for 60 hours a week rub it in candle rub it I in <laughs> i know them like the back of my hand and people are like, well, I can save money not hiring a graphic designer. It's like, well, you can go spend the rest of your life on the computer trying to figure out these programs, getting attached to your work and not doing, you know, nearly as good of a job yet because you don't have the experience. Or you can just pay somebody and, you know, kind of become a partnership that works off one another. And I think people hey. underestimate uh, working with a good designer because, you know, they see the money signs and they think they can do it themselves. And um, unfortunately, a lot of people don't take the time to research. They don't take the time to listen to these podcasts. They don't watch YouTube videos. They just dive in thinking they can do it. And I think there's a quote that I, you know, saw that it was, if you think good design is expensive, you should see how much bad design is going to cost you. Because, you know, you might be saving money up front, but in the end, 
you're probably not going to sell that product capture the audience that you want and really get the impact that you could. Um, yeah. So I think that's an important that's perfect. Good quote. Yeah, it's a perfect quote, Ronnie and, and Kendall. I love the the honesty of, of the two of you because the fact is is that yeah. When you're good at what you do, you can do it in 10, 15 minutes. So I always say that. I say, you got 20 minutes to play. And I'm like, oh my gosh, are you crazy? And it's fantastic. And then other people can spend five. Oh, I spent all day. And oh my God, you don't like my work. I spent all, you have no idea how much time I spent on to create this piece. And it's just like not happening. So I mm -hmm. love the point. And, and I love the point that, you know, if you pay little or do it yourself and at the end, you lost capturing that market because you make money in commodities and sell and buy and get it done. And that's one of the hardest things that are going on right now is, is that when you're, when you're contained, how do you stand out? And that's why this podcast of being um, captivating design is so, so important. Um, because what we're trying to do here is how to, how to, how to stand out. And I think you, um, and that captivating graphics of, of the image and what we're trying to lay. So if you're not a designer, and you have access to pre-canned software or you're, you're paying to buy a downloadable image because someone else took a picture and put it on Shutterstock or Adobe or whatever the pre-canned systems are you can have, is one of the things that are incredible that people don't realize is that you still can take all that art and merge it. Well, that's where your incredible designers like Kendall and, and Ronnie come into the play. But as a, as a background, I think that Ronnie, you hit it out of the park in your comments saying, it has to connect on an emotional level. And Kendall, you said, okay, have one object on that emotional level that they connect with. So, and less is more. And a combination of that, I think is, is that uh, several of the women that I know and men that will have something unique about them, whether in your case, you design, you're a dancer. So you're a swing dancer. You love, love, love swing dancing. And someone else might be a cook, but also let's say work in the real estate or finance industry, or someone might be, um, let's say that's into, you know, having pets. So you'll see a lot of ads now that have a pet in the ad. Like you see the, the automobile industry, here's a great one for you, Ronnie, that I've never seen so many ads of having dogs included in the commercials now ever on TV. Um, where you'll have seven dogs on a boat going by, like lap to luxury, wouldn't you have it? These dogs are living better than you sitting on the, on the curb. Um, or you'll have, you know, these five white, beautiful, long haired dogs driving a car, you know, doing donuts in the middle of the street. Um, and so that captivating of, of using, you know, an animal that you love and that's your, that's your way of connecting on an emotional level, I think really amplifies both of your messages are. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it's also <laughs> important to, uh, I think it's important to look at examples of good design too. And this can even be in videos. Like if you think about the Super Bowl commercials and you try to pull out why you couldn't stop watching that commercial or mm, why yes. you wanted to see it. Like this can, this can go into any design video and how they're captivating the, off, the audience, it still works. It's like you're talking about dogs. People's ambitions are lowered by dogs. People have really good childhood memories usually connected to dogs. Some people have really bad ones. But I mean, you have to like find something that connects with your audience and emotional responses are the strongest. They say that videos that go viral are usually going viral because you share that link because you want someone to feel what you just felt. So you cried, you laughed, it actually evoked a physical emotion and you want someone else to feel that. So you send it to someone you care about. And that's how these things go viral because you can't help but hit that share button. Same thing should be for an ad. It is harder to do because it's stagnant. It's within seconds. It's not a moving thing that can catch your attention, but it does the exact same thing. So be a very aware of your surroundings. Be aware of what attracts your eye and how it captivates you and try to figure out how to use that in your own design. I think that is perfectly said, Kendall, because I want to, I want to add the tip of the day. You want someone else to feel what you felt. You truly are whatever excites you about what you saw. You immediately want to share it. So there's your, your play it forward feeling, right? 
Um, mm -hmm. And that ad, so the idea is, is that whether it's a food recipe, whether it's a donut, you know, oh my gosh, I wish I, you know, you're out in a hot desert, I could just grab that glass of water or having a great, you know, um, drink or whatever. Um, or I wish I was, you know, stuck in this house and I could be out on the beach somewhere. Is, is that you have that environment that you're dreaming of it and you connect to someone to share that feeling. So if you happen to have an ad that you're, you know, in a, a sales proposition, then you just now created that less is more, but that feeling that, that Ronnie talked about that captivates to get you to go and hence you created the, the vehicle to live in. You now have that feeling. You, you, yeah, it had some, a lot of design going through it, but now you go, I get what it takes. I learned from it, but I now know how relatable that feeling is to owning your own space. <laughs> that will make it into a bigger space, right? Mm -hmm. All right. So if we were to sum it up here, and thank you all for uh, listening to us. This is fantastic. And having two incredible uh, people on here. And I'm so honored to have Kendall with me all these years. Kendall, what would be um, something that you would think would be really in the close up that are your three main don'ts do? I want to make sure that they can take away. We have the three visual effects we have on the positive side, but I want to make sure on the, on the, that we don't, so they can make sure they, they can, uh, yeah, as a beginner designer, don't do A, B, and C. What would those three things yeah. be? Yeah. Yeah, get out your pen and paper because I see this way too often. I can usually tell right away um, if someone did it themselves. Um, <laughs> you'd think this one would not happen, but for some reason it does. I mean, everyone knows what their face looks like. They've looked in the mirror. And yet, for some reason, when they're working with graphics, they tend to distort photos. So they make it extremely vertical or extremely horizontal. And their face does not look like it's been in one of those fun mirrors. I mean, it does when they do their graphic, but they know better. They should know that that's not what their face actually looks like. So my first tip is to hit the shift key. Um, right now, uh, Photoshop's in a transition where you no longer have to hit the shift key. It actually scales it for you and keeps the ratio um, by itself. But the way it has been done, or if you have an older version of Photoshop, or if you have that feature turned off, or if you're using Word document or another program, the shift key is your best friend. You hit the shift key and you grab the corner. And when you scale it, it keeps the ratio. If for some reason, the ratio is not being kept, then I would definitely go on YouTube and figure out what program you're using and how to keep the ratios. It's so commonly done and uh, it ruins the whole piece. It's a big, big giveaway and it's one of the easiest things to fix. And I would say, you know, proportionally scaling stuff is important with both images and text. True. Um, fonts are generally designed to have a certain proportion and look to them. If you start stretching it and smushing it, it's going to it's not going to look right. If you're trying to fill the space with the font, you might need to find a different font that actually works for what you're trying to do. Um, same thing with an image, you know, you might have to find another image that is working better with kind of the, the size that you're, you're working with with your graphic. I would say for number two, um, keep an open mind. So good design, especially something like photo manipulation is accomplished by finding the right photos that are harmonious. So I'm not like, no, I have to have the cookie. It has to go in a purple jar and I want it on the top of the skyscraper. I have to have that. Well, by trying to accomplish that exactly the way I was picturing it, I'm gonna have a very bad looking design because I was forcing the perspective. I was forcing the colors. When I'm doing a design, I'm looking to create something that has the same perspective. I'm looking for the same tones and lighting. If I'm looking for a building, that building has to have similar lighting to the person I'm putting in that photo. So you have to have a, an open mind. You have to be flexible because if you're super stuck in your ways on how you wanna design something, you're gonna have a bad design. You need to have an open mind. You have to have more than one idea so that you can play within that realm. I would say that in college, what they have you do is they make you do 200 logos of the same logo. Right. You have to sit there and you're sitting there cursing your teacher <laughs> as you sit there and try to come up with new ideas. But what happens is after you break, after you can no longer come up with any good ideas, you start to come up with a whole new way of thinking and a whole new set of ideas. 
So being very open to possibilities is a very positive way of, of designing. I love it because um, it, what you're doing real quick is, is that is you're really amplifying the opportunity to um, break down what you're forcing. I mean, it's cut and paste. You know, you're talking about when you talk about the shading, the lighting and the angles, all that has to mesh. I mean, that's what makes as you always say, a, a phenomenal designer on captivating art is that you, it looks like a pre, uh, like the picture was taken, not that it was cut and paste put together. So if you don't, if like Ronnie said, you squish the text and try to fit in the picture or the box, you have to, you know, change the font because you're trying to make it look like it was created that way um, versus enforced that way. Right. So then for the third rule, I would say is typography. Um, this is complicated because there are technically like 40 rules of typography that you learn in graphic school. When you're setting type on um, an ad or in a magazine, these rules are a dead giveaway on whether or not you've been to graphic design school. Um, there are too many for me to list. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I would say the biggest one is widows. Widows are when you leave uh, one word at the very end of a paragraph, you're supposed to at least leave two. Um, there's just way too many to count, but if you maybe Google it, there might be some of them online. Mm -hmm. But definitely like paying attention to typography, paying attention to how you're laying out that text, people do notice. You can definitely tell when a book's been self published because I can tell based on how they laid out the text. I mean, it's it's time consuming. It's little things, but if you really want to achieve, um, you know, be a good designer, you need to look into that stuff. Excellent. Well, I think that's uh, really sums it up. So in parting, we have three roles, balance, rule number one, rule number two, contrast, rule number three, hierarchy. We heard from Ronnie to make sure that you really focus on the the target where and why and the and the feeling right to get that to go and then you heard from Kendall that you really got to make sure that you make sure the don'ts and obvious dead giveaways because you don't want it to be that you're looking at the mistakes versus then what the message is um, you know it's always about the get, keeping it simple keeping it to white matter with very simple one design off um, so excellent excellent so. Um, we are so excited because I'd like to take this opportunity real quick, not only to thank you, but to, we're so excited that we're going to be coming up with our new website here. It's coming out. It's going to be coming out any day. Um, and all of that design creativity and artwork that we've been uh, curating for the last 10 years and, and updating is going to be out there. Um, so we're so excited in that with the magazine and the WEAR report, uh, the Women Housing Ecosystem report. And the integration of all those ads and stuff that Kendall's incredible vision and you know it takes not only the environment that you work in because you can have what you learned in school and what is adaptable today and I always like to relate to, uh, to what Elton John has done you know over the last 60 years he's evolved decade after decade to stay with the current of the time so it's new in the art and and captivating art has to be evolving it can't be just you know well we did it back this way it's now this way um, you know, it's a, it's a new and evolving thing. So um, how would we, um, Kendall, in closing, um, what would be one of your um, pride things that you've done personally that has been captivating of, of a designer that you'd like to say? Mm, I'd say that also, like, whenever you talk to, like, a musician or a book writer or anything, they always say their newest piece is their favorite piece. <laughs> so I think it's like the act of creating. I wouldn't say that because I've been doing this for so long, I try not to get attached. I try not to, I mean, I, I feel like the satisfaction of a client is a super, is more rewarding than the piece itself. And also, you know, just the act of creating is the rewarding part for me because at the end of the day, I'm not creating for me. I'm creating for another end goal, another person. And that's fine. It can be very motivating, but it's, but at the end of the day, I am motivated by the creation and by the satisfaction of the client. Well, I think back to what you said too. I think, you know, you're always evolving. Your skills are always growing. So, you know, a lot of times it is your most current piece that you, you really do appreciate because you, 
you know how much you've learned, you know how, much, how far you've come. And, you know, I think as a designer, you're always trying to create your best work. So the more you know and the more you learn, the better you're going to be. So, yeah. Yeah, experience. Yeah, no, I, I think it's, it's fantastic. And the fact that, you know, Kendall, um, you know, hit it in, in the sense that, you know, the, keep the attachment, but the joy of the journey, right? Of making yeah, it, creating the process. Yeah. Um, because it, and, and you go out and when you see someone really enjoy what you've created, like Ronnie in the automobile industry and the design and the futuristic of the designs that you created, um, you know, we're going to, the world's not going to be the same after this pandemic on how we're going to travel, how we're going to interact and how that's going to be. So, um, you know, those designs are going to be very important, captivating utilization balance. Uh, on a three-dimensional playing field versus then just on a, on a two-dimensional service is going to be so, so powerful. So thank you both for an incredible time. I thought this was absolutely fabulous to see both sides of the fence. And I think as, the, as our listeners, I'm sure will love um, what we had to say because this is something that everyone needs to experience because in clothing and cooking and design of utilization of time management it all plays into this because what it, what do you do well and what does someone else do well and how you can interact in the relationship because we are spending a lot more time um with our significant others because <laughs> home and shelter right so thank you all for listening to Know the Rules of the Podcast for captivating graphics um, and crafti- uh, captivating design because we really want to bring that to, to home. I wanted to thank our guests, um, uh, Con- uh, Kendall and Ro- uh, Ronnie Kederick. It would be nice. Uh, Roderick, if I could need to pronounce her name, it'd be great after seven years for those who know me, right? Um, and then the other piece is that how do you get a hold of us? So I want to make sure that everyone follows us on iTunes, on nrb.com, also on nrb.com forward slash podcast um, and all the information we have out there there's our eight o'clock a.m every wednesday morning every wednesday we're going to have a new and exciting podcast so thank you all and thank you have a great day and be safe and healthy to everyone and thank you again uh, ron uh, ronnie and kendall so have a wonderful day and we'll talk to you soon all right thanks desiree thanks thank you